Trust is cheaper than control. Welcome to part three. I hope you've watched parts one and two. These all build on each other. And I want to go straight to the heart of capitalism and say, look, but in capitalism, there is trust, right? Money is a mechanism for creating trust at a distance. You give me a dollar. I have a dollar that I can go spend somewhere else. It doesn't matter who you were so much. The dollar helps. Markets create trusted places for exchange, and enlightened consumers, a word if you've watched me elsewhere, I can't stand, go where they want and get what they need. This whole system creates a way that people can kind of trust each other and coexist. Well, I'm taking a pretty different angle to this. These things are sort of true but really broken. Uh, but what I want to say is that capitalism as a structure forces what I call design for mistrust. It forces companies to mistrust the rest of us. Part of what's doing this is profit maximization. The absolute squeeze on profits, uh, Wall Street's short-term mentality. There's really good books recently about short-termism. Why don't we have any long-term thinking anymore? But the pressure for profit maximization, an idea that is being debunked as we speak very beautifully, uh, leads to a lot of this. It squeezes managers to go do the kinds of things I'm going to talk about here, such as overprotecting their intellectual property. Small example. Do you know what the original copyright term was? How long copyright lasted? It was 14 years from the publication of the work, renewable only once. Statute of Anne, 1710, England. We kind of copied that, and then we've, we kept expanding and expanding, and expanding it. And today, do you know what it is? For corporate works, it's 95 years after publication of the work, and everything is copywritten by default. You don't have to apply for it. Uh, in the old one, the original one, it was 14 years. You could only uh, renew it once, and you had to apply. So that's just an example of what corporations have done, how they kind of own our government to create a really favorable world for themselves, ignoring the consequences of what they're doing, because overprotecting intellectual property is a terrible thing for humanity, actually. So all of this in the quest for a sustainable competitive advantage, which is sort of code speak for an unfair competitive advantage. Nobody loves competitive advantage like a monopolist or maybe an oligopolist. So companies really seek that. Uh, there's so much in incredible market pressure for just more stuff. If you have a great quarter, if you knock the, you know, if you knock it out of the park and your numbers are better than, they, than, than expected, that just resets the bar at zero. Now you've got to deliver more next time. Large companies need to continue to grow at incredible paces. Nobody can really be sustainable. Nobody can really be consistent and be rewarded by the present marketplace. Wall Street hates consistency. They really want overperformance. In the middle of all this, we have incredibly exorbitant executive pay. Uh, there's this myth that this is the only way to get these great people to run these companies. Mostly, that's not true. These are not such great people. They rose to the top of organizations that are very efficient at sucking money out of their markets. Uh, so as a result, you have short executive tenure. The companies have very little liability for their externalities because there's not enough regulation, not enough other things. And the companies take very little responsibility for the commons that they touch. That's starting to change. Uh, and here, I'm being stereotypical about capitalism. There's a lot of enlightened companies out there that are breaking many or most of the bullet points on this page. But, but this, this is the stereotype, and, and still the major market moves this way. So they take little responsibility for commons. They have very few long-term incentives. All of the, in fact, all of the long-term ties have been snipped. They've severed the long-term relationships that used to mean they were in relationship with their clients, with their communities, with the commons, with the government. Those have mostly been snipped very efficiently. So what we have is a world where short-term incentives rule. I want to give you two examples. I want to talk about agriculture and entertainment, both very large businesses. So what are capitalism's effects on agriculture? Well, we end up engineering plants that don't reproduce, the, the Monsanto's terminator gene, and then uh, plants that are not susceptible to pesticides, so they are Roundup Ready, another Monsanto uh, gift to, to, to us, so that we can spray pesticides all over the crops. We then pass legislation to protect all of our intellectual property. We sue farmers who violate our intellectual property, even if it's unintentional. So pollen blew over from the crop next door, which had bought some Monsanto products, pollinated some of our field. Uh, people come onto our land, test our crops, discover that, and sue us out of existence. We sue the seed cleaners out of existence. 
There, there used to be a dozen or two guys with, with rigs on the back of their trucks, which would clean some of your seeds so that you could keep some of your seed to plant for next year. This is the way agriculture has been for the 5,000, 10,000 years we've had agriculture. You keep some of your seed to plant it next year, but no, 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 because we want plants that don't reproduce, so you have to go back to the well and buy more from your supplier, we get rid of the seed cleaners. How efficient is that? We also buy up the seed companies so we can control the stock. We then have a problem because there's unintended consequences at every corner of this stupid mechanism. We get superbugs that are resistant to our pesticides, so we have to change and reformulate. We get monocrops that become very fragile. Uh, along the way, we make life really, really hard for small farmers because the profits just get sucked right out of farming. And worse, we make agriculture fragile. We destroy the soil. We make the entire infrastructure really endangered. A company like Monsanto that, that I think workers at Monsanto think they're feeding the world, and I don't understand how they work there, given everything I've seen about the company. Uh, this, thing, this then requires therapy for everyone involved, a little tongue-in-cheek, and my poster child here is Monsanto. There's clearly other companies in this business, but this is the large company that has really run the table uh, in agriculture and is endangering agriculture and our planet as we speak. That's a cost. And it's all about control. You'll see, I've just tried to name some of the ways in which companies like Monsanto are busy trying to control agriculture and the food system. And there's plenty, plenty more. So these are costs that don't fit neatly into the previous presentations I did, which is why I'm going there here. And I know it's, it's sort of a hard luck message for capitalists. I think capitalism can be fixed, but not the consumer mass market capitalism that's fixated on profit maximization that we are steeped in today. So let's switch for an instant to entertainment, uh, which was once called culture. We used to sing with each other. We used to tell stories around the campfire. We've basically industrialized the whole thing. We've borrowed folk tales and prior art. And, and here, my poster child is Disney. And I will disclose to you that my first real job in the world was at the Disney in Anaheim, the, the Disneyland, the original park. Uh, I was a guide on the Jungle Cruise, so I did, worked that two winters and one summer season, had to memorize a spiel, got to shoot hippos with a nickel-plated Smith & Wesson 38, a part of the ride I am sure is gone now. But uh, Disney, Walt, borrowed a bunch of folk tales and prior art and then turned them into his very famous movies. He built a huge base of IP assets, which then, of course, he went on to overprotect them. He went on to pass legislation, well, not Walt directly, but his descendants, to protect his IP like the Copyright Term Extension Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and the worldwide treaties, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Trade Organization, whose major roles are basically to force everybody to adhere to these overprotected rules. Uh, he then force, uh, Disney then forces the, in, the PC industry, Disney and other companies, but the copyright industries, force PCs to bake in copy protection schemes. There was plenty of controversy about this in the 80s and 90s, uh, Intel, Microsoft being the, the principal sort of enforcers of these sorts of things, uh, and we're trying to mold good consumers along the way, but in fact what we do is we denude the commons. The commons of culture winds up being swept clear uh, things that need to exist and freedoms we need to have to remix culture and make things happen. Fortunately, mixing and remixing is damned easy and it's really hard to prosecute, so people are doing it left, right, and center. But the legal infrastructure, if we actually towed the line and paid for copyright permissions and solicited permissions for all the things that we do, we could not exist in that world. And again, the poster child here is Disney, uh, the tragic kingdom. This is Trust is Cheaper Than Control, Part 3, Capitalism and Trust. Sorry if it was bad news. The next section will be about commons and community. This is part of a larger work on trust, which is part of a larger thesis, The Relationship Economy. I'm Jerry Mikulski. Uh, to dive deeper, either go to jerrymikulski.com or just subscribe to this channel here on YouTube. I'll be doing more of these videos. Thanks for your attention.